Welcome to Brain Pondering, to your window in the, into the world of brain research with unfiltered conversations with scientists at the forefront of neuroscience, neurology, psychology. I'm Mark Masson, the host. Today, my guest is Rajiv Ratan. He's a professor of neurology and neuroscience at Will Cornell uh, Medicine and CEO of the Burke Neurological Institute up in New York. And his own personal research uh, laboratory uh, focuses on cell stress responses to cell stress, adaptive responses in the context of trying to figure out ways to reduce damage, for example, following a stroke or traumatic brain injury, and importantly, to enhance recovery and maybe uh, some of the some of the things he's working on now will be translated to humans, hopefully, pretty soon. So welcome, Raj. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. It's so nice. It's a real privilege and honor for me to have this conversation with you because I've admired um, your work uh, so much for so many years and um, and uh, and have been heavily influenced by it. Let's start with your background. So you're your parents were, they immigrated here from India, is that right? Yeah, um, my dad came in 1955 um, to train uh, as a heart surgeon in Pittsburgh. And um, he uh, went back in 1958 uh, and he knew my mom for two days. They got married, they came back. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, a typical they, typical Indian <laughs> that's right arranged marriage and uh an arranged marriage that lasted uh sometimes uh very blissfully and other times not so blissfully for 60 years and they um they loved uh Pittsburgh it was a great really welcoming place for immigrants um the year I was born um which uh was 1960 and uh and that was the year that the uh, Pirates beat the Yankees um, to win the World Series. Uh, was, was that R Roberto Clemente? Was he on? Well, he was, but later. So the, the story was that Bill Mazeroski, so it was, the game was tied going to the bottom of the ninth inning, seventh game, oh. and Mazeroski hit a home run to win the series for the Pirates. So they, I think, I think it 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 presaged a lot of my life because um I I was I think for them sports became an immediate way to assimilate and um as sort of a child of immigrants growing up in America I was I was an avid athlete I was always participating in different sports and I think it was a great way to fit in So they they had your parents had to learn the rules of uh, baseball and football rather than cricket. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and and it's it's uh, it's amazing. Some of my fondest memories were actually watching, sitting on the floor. My well, my dad was on the couch. I mean, he was a heart surgeon, so sometimes when he was home, he was he was pretty tired. But uh, watching football games with him, and uh, and so that was a, a, an other fringe benefit for me of of being sort of an avid sports participant and sports enthusiast. And, and I'm glad to say that that's something I've passed on uh, to my kids. Um, now, now did your did your parents, well, it's your dad, surgeon. So I guess they encourage you to go to medical school or not? Um, well, I think you know this story pretty well is that um, I was I was told I could do pretty much whatever I wanted, but really the reality was is I was either going to be an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer. <laughs> you know that 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 the 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 socialization is very strong, and and I think I was I I was obviously uh, much more driven towards math and science, and uh, and I was very fortunate. I ended up going to Amherst College uh, as an undergraduate, and. Um, they were the first college in the country to actually have a neuroscience major, and uh, and a guy named Steve George, and it was it, it really paradoxical because you think of liberal arts colleges, mm 
as doing everything that's kind of not uh, practical and differentiated. And, um, and yet I had a great opportunity to become a neuroscientist as an undergraduate. And this was, you know, I started in 1977 and I graduated in 81. So as you know, there weren't a lot of uh, neuroscience programs, at least at the undergraduate level yeah. at that time. So yeah. it was really a treat. And so I think I, I went through the neuroscience program. It, it happened that uh, actually uh, the neuroscience course is almost perfectly overlaid with the score the courses to go to medical school, but I had a chance to do a senior thesis. And my thesis was um, uh, focused on the role of cerebellar stimulation in psychiatric disorders. There was a guy uh, mm -hmm. named Heath at Tulane who'd been doing this for patients with schizophrenia. And so my thesis was ironically using 2-deoxy, radio label 2-deoxy glucose to actually look at what the impact of cerebellar stimulation in rats is on the cerebrum. And in writing my thesis, I had to learn all about the cerebellar circuitry. And yeah. so I read a lot of papers by a guy named Rodolfo Linas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and so- and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about calcium at some point <laughs> in that conversation. Yeah, well, but the, the interesting thing was is that I one of the reasons I went to NYU was that I wanted to work with Rodolfo, and um, and I went. Well, he, he he had kind of a reputation, uh, <laughs> being kind of. That's right. Uh, so I went into his office, and I, I and I he he said to me, he said, "Are you really uh, interested in understanding the nervous system, or do you think you're just going to come and play around and do internal medicine?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, well, you can go down the hall. There's a guy named Mike Shalansky <laughs> who might want to, to have you work with him. And so I ended up uh, fortuitously working with Mike Shalansky. And, uh, and that's where I started to study calcium. And that's where our common interest first started. Yeah, that's right. Because we both, at that time, so Roger Chan had just developed these fluorescent probes based on EGTA, this calcium chelating molecule, but he modified them so they fluoresce when calcium right. binds or the fluorescence changes anyway. And then the other important thing though, for the initial studies, like you and I both started with cultured cells, right? Is uh, he put a, I think a methyl group on it and made it lipid soluble, so. Right, right, so they, they were all the the as you remember the progenitor was quintu, which was essentially EGTA, uh, and which had acetoxy methyl esters that derivatized all the carboxyl groups, and so they, it would diffuse into cells. Nonspecific esterases would cleave off the uh, these uh, acetoxy methyl esters, and expose the carboxyl charged groups trapping the dye in the cell. Yeah. And um, and one of the reasons why I think Michael was so interested in, and another person who was very influential as I was studying calcium was Fred Maxfield. And Michael was really interested in the cytoskeleton and neurons. But, um, and the question was, can calcium be spatially localized in cells in a way that allows vectorial disassembly of microtubules? because one of Michael's claims to fame was to purify tubulin. And, um, and, and so the problem with Quinn two is it had very low quantum efficiency. And so you needed a lot of dye in the cell and it tended to diffuse gradients. And in order to visualize gradients, we ended up studying what was the aplesia of, of, of mitosis, a, a, a um, uh, a the the endosperm from the African blood lily, and there are beautiful pictures of this. I think in the halls of the NIH. Um, and, but what you can literally see is you can see, the, if you take these endosperm, you can see the chromosomes moving. That's how big they are with the naked eye. <laughs> <laughs> and so we we were able to load Quin two into these cells and show that 
during anaphase when the uh, chromosomes were separating that there are areas of increased calcium at each of the poles that is driving the disassembly of microtubules towards um, and the chromosomes movement towards the poles, but allowing assembly in the interphase zone so that it could push things apart. And it, that uh, uh, I was actually the second author because uh, Charlie Keith started that work and it was published in Nature in 1985. And yeah. and then as Fura was de developed, we we moved on to to showing similar observations in in um, in eukaryotic uh, you know cells. And uh, but uh, I I learned so much about I mean it was an incredible department with fantastic graduate students who were who were with me, and I learned so much about technique development about assays, about, you know, how when you build a unique piece of equipment like this, it was essentially running 24 hours a day. So there were times where we would do experiments all during the night. And um, it was it was really fantastic uh, scientific training. I re it really uh, only uh, fueled um, really a love of being in the lab and experimentation. And that so, was, you didn't mention, that was at NYU. That was at NYU, yeah. And, and uh, yeah. And, and, and then for, for your, you you were in Baltimore for a while, right? At, yeah, so I was in Baltimore for seven years. And I was fortunate, very fortunate um, to do my residency at Hopkins. And I think you know that group extremely well. And, um, you know, Hopkins is an incredible, uh, it was just it was an incredible place to uh, train as a physician, and you know I think the the institutional spirit and uh, you know just uh, I, I I think a place where uh, great science uh, segues so seamlessly into compassionate care, I think is is so rare and. Yeah. You know, I I I really uh, loved being in, in that uh, environment and training in that environment with um, you know Dick Johnson and Guy McCann and Jack Griffin, and uh, uh, it was terrific. And <clears throat> then you know you'll you'll uh, then when I was getting ready to um, to actually go back to the lab, I. I, since I was interested in calcium, and uh, um, I I called Saul up, yeah, and uh, and it wasn't a very coherent um, pitch that I made, and I, you know Saul he's extremely perceptive, so he said I don't really have any room in my lab, <laughs> uh, but I have, uh, but there one of the people who worked with me has room, and it was Jay Barabat, yeah. And and it turned out to be a real stroke of luck, um, because it at, at that time um, one of Jay's postdocs was a guy named Tim Murphy, yeah. And Tim had as and you know I, I initially I was going to study calcium, but I think in talking to Michael and Fred and a lot of people, they said everybody's studying calcium and cell death you should really try to find something else. And so I got to Jay's lab and Tim was there. And as you probably remember, while Tim was with Joe Coyle, he elucidated this model, novel model of glutamate uh, uh, cytotoxicity, which was non-receptor mediated. And that was dependent on the XC minus transporter. And these are really the seminal studies that laid the foundation for what we now know as ferroptosis. And, and, and so that got you interested in glutamate in, in a kind of a unusual way, got you interested in oxidative stress. Right. Well, it, 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 it was, you're right. I, I, it, it was so, you know, when I was looking around at what I was going to do, it was so obvious to me that the problem with the field of a uh, the problem with understanding oxidative stress was the lack of of appropriate in vitro models 
And if you looked at it, and I think you probably remember this as well, if people wanted to try to model oxidative stress, what they would do is they would they would add non-physiologic concentrations of oxidants to cell. Hydrogen peroxide. And... Yeah, and nitric oxide and whatever else, the hypochlorous acid, whatever else they could find. And what was great about this model is, is that because glutamate blocked the uptake of cysteine, the oxidized form of cysteine, it ultimately depleted the versatile antioxidant glutathione generated an imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants and really just use the endogenous oxidants to drive death. Yeah. And, um, and so it, it, it was, you know, Tim said to me, I'm, I'm much more interested in synaptic plasticity. I don't think I want to study this model anymore. Why don't you, uh, here have at it. And, um, and and while I was a resident, um, I was very fortunate to make the observation that cell death in this model could be blocked by macromolecular synthesis. And that suggested that uh, oxidative death could be programmed. And that, and, so you put in inhibitors of protein synthesis. Right, that's like right. Like cyclohexamide or something. Cyclohexamide, actinomycin D. Yeah. And uh, and we were able to demonstrate that they would protect um, neurons. And as you know, it was it was a little bit of a paradigm shift because you know I think the 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 uh, and it happened at a time where a larger paradigm shift was happening, and that people were becoming interested in apoptosis. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, Korsmeyer had identified BCL two. Mm -hmm. And it was apparent that um, cancer was uh, the result of a lack of uh, death, and it was obvious to, I mean, obvious, clearly obvious to you, and and maybe many in the neuroscience field that uh, the flip side could be uh, uh, apply. And and I think what was um, what was um, really uh, uh, fascinating is that, I mean, and I think that's what catalyzed an interest in transcription. But interestingly, we showed that the effects of macromolecular synthesis inhibitors could also be ascribed to simply shunting cysteine from protein synthesis to glutathione. And, um, and I think that uh, we initially, um, you know, we, we we initially had one big paper. We sent it to Neuron. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, the the people who were strongly in favor of the idea of of thanogenes, um, like Gene Johnson, didn't like that idea that maybe there were other metabolic pathways. Um, so it got rejected. We separated it into two papers. One went to the Journal of Neuroscience Science, and the other went to the Journal of Neurochemistry. And I think uh, it's sort of a great example of um, of uh, how um, you know something topical can be published doesn't have to be published in Nature and Science for it to sort of get a lot of attention because that paper got was very highly cited and um, and I think helped me uh, get my job first job much more quickly than I otherwise would have. So. You know, I think in, in previous podcasts, at some point, we've talked about mTOR pathway. Yeah. So is, you know, is it, is this, does, if you inhibit mTOR with rapamycin, does it have the same effect uh, as inhibiting protein synthesis with cyclohexamine? It does. Yeah. So it's protective as well. And, um, and activating ER stress has the same and all the activators of the integrated stress response, and um, and 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 you know the the evolution to that idea um, actually is an interesting story uh, that I, I don't I may have told you about it. So, you know, after we we uh, I think you and I both were very interested in NF kappa B, yeah, and I think. I think that uh, you were finding that it was actually neuroprotective, and I was finding, at least in a virus-induced death model, that it was actually 
uh, propelling them. And so we, we got very interested in the idea because it formally still was possible that it, because macromolecular synth synthesis inhibitors were so protective, we were really interested in what was the second, what was the ROS messenger that was, what, that was unleashed when you depleted glutathione that could activate transcription factors like Kappa B or Jun that yeah. ultimately might lead to death. So we did a kind of simple-minded and naive experiment. We took catalase that we bought from Sigma and we loaded up the extracellular bathing medium with catalase. And the idea, as you know, is that peroxide is uncharged, so it diffuses through membranes. So the thought was, is if you load up the medium with catalase, that you would create a sink and protect the cells. And what we found is that that catalase from Sigma could protect everything under the sun. It was protective against serum deprivation, sporin, everything. But if you look at that preparation, if you were to put, put it in solution and look at it in a in a 15 millimeter con con conical tube, you would see that that preparation was really dirty. So huh. what we did is we we did a uh, experiment where we inhibited catalase activity and the protective effect didn't go away. So the first thing I did is I, we, I went over to see Rick Huguenier and we started, you know, he had a number of columns that they used purify peptides and so he said sure you can use it and uh so we started a purification on our own and um sure enough we were able to show that if you get rid of the catalase the protective effect is there we put it through a size uh exclusion chromatography and we were starting to get to a a, a, a purified activity and then um i was fortunate um so Lee so what, Rubin, what was the source? So you you bought this from Sigma, that chemical company. And yeah. What was their source? I mean, liver. It was liver. Liver. Yeah. So, so there's we, something else in the from the liver probably that's protective. That's right. So we ultimately were able to purify the. So there was a. So we did uh, isoelectric focusing followed by gel electrophoresis. And we identified a 36 kilodalton protein that was present in three non-sequential bioactive fractions. It wasn't protective in any other fractions. We cut it out. This was with Fred Ash and Lee Rubin at Azi at the time. And we sent it to Bill Land at the uh, Harvard undergrad. And it, it's it, 202 amino acids a sequence. It's all identical to arginase. <laughs> and, um, and it turned out that what arginase was doing, so arginase is a metalloenzyme too, so it probably co-purified with catalase using whatever sigma used, but we found- does, does arginase, it doesn't have selenium in it, does it? No. 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 So we initially thought, oh, it's arginase, a degrading arginine, maybe that means that NO is the relevant, but as you probably know- Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, uh, as you probably know, um, it, at that stage of development, the cortical cultures we had didn't express NOS. So, in, and we were able to demonstrate that um, if you took any amino acid degrading enzyme, you could actually protect the neurons. And it, it ultimately, we showed that what the amino acid degrading enzymes were doing was inhibiting a, a, a kind, depriving amino acids, activating a kinase called GCN2 which is an upstream, one of the part of the integrated stress response uh -huh. that then phosphorylates EIF2 uh -huh. alpha, inhibits global translation, and that then uh, protected. And we were able to correlate the inhibition of protein synthesis perfectly with the protection uh, by arginase. And I remember, I remember giving... Uh, 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 a talk at a symposium in North Carolina and Gene was there and he came up to me afterwards. And, you know, I mean, he was one of my scientific heroes. He said, Raj, that was a real blunderbust. 
you spent three years purifying that uh, contaminate and you, all you did was find another protein synthesis inhibitor. <laughs> and to, to some to some extent, he was correct, but um, but I think it got us interested not only in the protein synthesis inhibition part of it, but in, so as you probably know, with the, with the integrated stress response, you get the paradoxical translation of this transcription factor ATF4. Yeah. And so it actually got us interested in, in ATF4 transcription. And, and that's another uh, long story. That, and so uh, the general idea is by imposing an external stress on the cells, you can activate the intrinsic mechanisms which cells evolved to protect themselves against a range of kinds of stressors. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. So uh, actually the, the formative experiments that we did that really got me interested in this idea, I wish I were smart enough to have thought that's the direction I should take the lab, but the 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 story is really it's it's another twist one with twists and turns that will surprise you so i the, one of the first questions that i asked when i got into the lab full time it was to take this ferroptosis model and actually uh, and can you raj can you describe so ferric ferric, ferric or ferrous refers to iron and ptosis Further to falling off or dying, right? So, yes. Kind of, who who coined the term? It, it, it's it was coined by Brent Stockwell, you know, uh, from the okay. work Greek word ferrum for mm -hmm. iron, and uh, as you point out, tosis for falling off, and uh, and it it didn't happen till 2012. Yeah, because uh, I, I don't remember seeing it until. Yes, but, but and we'd done a lot of work earlier exposing neurons to iron, and you know looked how it caused uh, oxidation of the membrane lipids, and then you get these bits of the lipids that some of them can do bad things in the cell. Right, I think a lot of the work you did, like with four four hydroxynoenol, mm -hmm. and so, but w the 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 interesting story here is that. Around 1991, when I was still a resident, uh, this group, Cra Crapper McLaughlin and a, a group in Canada had shown that intramuscular desferoxamine oh, yeah. could, um, for two years, could essentially stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And so... You know, so, so sorry to interrupt, Raj, but so... So at that point, I was at University of Kentucky, right? And yeah. Bill, Bill Marksberry was kind of my mentor from the standpoint of the, you know, pathology and stuff. And they were, they had this uh, method. It's it's kind of like atomic absorption spectroscopy. Essentially, they called laser activated something elemental analysis. But anyway, they'd have these sections of tissue from a person with Alzheimer's or control, and they put it in this llama device, and it, you can kind of visualize where the cell bodies of the neurons are, and they essentially burn that with the laser, wow. and they get the spectrum, and the, depending on what wavelengths or whatever, you can tell. So they looked at aluminum, right? There's kind of this not based on any science, really, but this notion that aluminum pans were causing Alzheimer's disease, and not, and but one of the things they did find was iron. Ah, interesting. In the neurofibrillary tangles. Ah, yeah, interesting. So it, 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 we, you know, as I was reading the the literature, I, and I wish I I had access to that technique, but as I was reading the literature, I realized that. We don't really understand how iron chelators are protecting neurons, so we decided to see what they did um, to glutamate, um, you know, oxidative glutamate toxicity, and as expected, we got complete protection. Uh, and it was it was dependent on iron because if you iron loaded uh, the DFO, it didn't protect. And if you used other iron chelators, they protected. But what was really interesting is, as you probably remember, um, 
we used to measure cell death, we used LDH release, mm -hmm. which was, you know, developed, I think, in 1987 by Dennis Choi in yeah. his lab. And the idea was you would measure the amount released into the medium as a function of total LDH in the dish. And just that... as I'm trying to, for, for people who aren't necessarily into the science. Oh. So, so if someone has a heart attack, right, right. Well, I use some other things now, but uh, so whenever this LDH uh, molecule, when a cell is alive, then its membrane is intact. It stays in the cell, and there shouldn't be any outside the cell. That's right. So if you're if you have a heart attack and your heart cell, some of your heart cells are dying, there'll be an increase in LDH in the blood, and that's one way they, uh, in you know, addition to other things they use to diagnose heart attack. Yeah. So and I think that's an it, it, so in essence you're right it's a it's a, an enzyme that's released from the cell only when it's dying yeah. so you can actually measure the enzyme activity outside of the cell as a marker for whether cells are dying or and the assumption of that method is that if you treat with a drug that the relationship between the activity of the enzyme and the number of cells should stay constant. Well, what, what we found is that even though the cells were completely protected and said, in essence, no LDH was released, the amount of LDH activity, the amount of enzyme activity of this enzyme went up by 400%. And so I think for people who aren't familiar, and I'm glad you reoriented me because I forgot we we're talking to a more general uh, audience. Lactate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that when you your cells don't have enough oxygen uh, or if your mitochondria are not functioning, they help generate a molecule called NAD plus that allows you to generate enough energy by essentially revving the glycolysis engine up. And so we hypothesized and and there was a thought then that you know the majority of bad oxidants actually came from mitochondria and mm -hmm. so so the thought was well maybe what dfo desferoxamine the iron chelator maybe what it's doing is it's somehow either making the cell believe it's hypoxic or maybe it's inhibiting mitochondrial function and thereby reducing the load of oxidants but from the mitochondria, but allowing them to generate enough ATP from glycolysis. And when we looked by immunoblot at all the glycolytic enzymes, remember there are a number of enzymes that convert glucose into pyruvate, so it can be used by the mitochondria. That pyruvate is then goes into lactate by LDH. All of the glycolytic enzymes were increased. And then I was a little, and we actually also were able to show that the effect of the iron chelator was transcriptional. And I was, uh, we were stuck and I was sitting in the, in the well, I was, I used to go to the Welch library on Wednesday and yeah. on Sundays. And um, I was always impressed because there's a very famous cancer biologist named Bert Vogelstein, who also I used to see there. And it was before PubMed and what Bert used to do is he'd be thumbing through the journals and then he'd be looking through almost every journal and then he'd finish and there'd be like this bonfire of journals on the table. I realized, you know, I couldn't do that. I was in a member of the National Academy of Sciences, but I still look through all the journals and I, I come to G JBC and I find this article and it says, the transcriptional regulation of glycolytic enzymes by the transcription factor hypoxia inducible factor one. And in that paper, Greg Semenza showed that iron chelators are hypoxia mimics that upregulate all the glycolytic enzymes. And so I was very fortunate. I thought, oh, and this guy is at Hopkins. So I called Greg up and I said, Greg, I think we've just rediscovered what you've published can you help me? And to make a long story short, what we were finding was that iron chelators were stabilizing HIF-1, upregulating all the glycolytic enzymes. Mm 
and the evidence that and and that's really what got us interested in the whole idea so for people who aren't familiar with hif one it's hypoxia inducible factor one and it's a protein that is expressed in all the cells of our body and as we sit here with normal sufficient oxygen there are a family of enzymes that are oxygen sensors called the hif hydroxylases and those enzymes take oxygen, iron, and 2-oxybutyrate as cofactors, and they convert it to a tag on the HIF-1 molecule that tags it for degradation. So in every cell of our body, HIF is being synthesized and degraded. But if oxygen falls below a critical tension, these enzymes, these oxygen sensors fail to function. HIF is now not tagged, it's stabilized, it dimerizes with its partner, which is constantly expressed. And then it moves into the nucleus and it transcriptionally upregulates every gene that you would want to be upregulated if your body were hypoxic. It is the most elegant uh, uh, adaptive system. And I looked at this and I said, you know, there was this, I, I said, this could be the mechanism by which Iron chelators are so broadly neuroprotective in the nervous system because there were a hundred genes that were upregulated. They worked at a at a at, at a cellular level, a local level, and a systemic level, and it was a system that evolved over millions of years um, for metazoans. And I thought this is this is fantastic. I, this is and so the the critical experiment that we did at that time was it turns out that cobalt chloride is also a um, is also a uh, hypoxia mimic and cobalt chloride not only activated HIF, but it protected cells from ferroptosis and, it and that's had a little complicated because it also inhibits calcium channels yeah so it was time. It was consistent with the overall hypothesis. Yeah. You're ex actually exactly right. That was a complicating factor, but we did later experiments where we actually molecularly manipulated these enzymes and also uh, pharmacologically manipulated them. But but I think the 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 um, the it it I think it was very formative uh, for me, and then it. You know, I think one of the one of the issues uh, uh, I just gave a, a talk on this. One of the issues we deal with right now is work we do in animal models. You know, young animals usually genetically identical, not always. Um, that how do, it it often translates poorly to humans because we don't have the comorbidities, we don't have the genetic complexities, and so it really makes it difficult to believe that we can define single targets that are going to affect this broad array of pathologies that mm -hmm. exist. And I think one of the exciting things about these transcriptional programs that are involved in stress adaptation is that they involve large numbers of genes that have the ability potentially to tackle that pathophysiologic heterogeneity. And that's where I would really like, you know, I, I think we don't think that that um the iron key the the you know there we think they're still inhibiting an iron and two oxyglutarate dependent dioxygenase, because now we know there are many enzymes like this, but we don't think it's driving HIF expression. And um, um but but I think that I, I would be very eager at some point to ho hope to see this idea get tested in humans. Yeah. Uh, so, and so, in, yeah, as you mentioned, these animal models, for example, stroke model, again, you have genetically peer animals and you occlude the exact same artery in the brain for the exact same amount of time. And, you know, so you, you, you can pick out effects, statistically significant effects, if you do enough number of animals of some intervention. But then when you go to the humans, yeah, 
there could be some effect, but you can't pick it out because there's so much, you know, air. I um, totally agree. I totally agree. You can't, there's not enough of an effect. Uh, you need a thousand patients in order to pick up the signal. Yeah. And often we don't do pay, uh, studies with enough patients to be able to do that. And as far as the strokes, a really good example where it's been known for a long time. And you talked about hypoxia. So obviously when the blood supply is reduced to your brain, um, there's less oxygen, hypoxia. There's also less glucose. And, but it's been known for a long time. If you subject, if you include an, include an artery, so induce hypoxia briefly. Yes. A little bit. And then you wait hours or the next day or the next day and then you come back and you do a full bone stroke there's some of the neurons survive that would have otherwise not survived had not you exposed to hypoxia and i you know i used to exercise a lot i've got some issues now actually i've got a a channelopathy ah sorry yeah. to hear that yeah so i got a it's something called primary erythromalacia it's a mutation in a voltage-dependent sodium channel that's expressed in nociceptive neurons. Huh. And so I have this hypersensitivity. But but anyway... Um, that, and that only popped up later, or did you have that? Yeah, well, no, I've had pain issues. I don't know if when I came up there, uh, well, that's been 20 years, uh, I don't know how long ago, yeah. to the Burke, right? I came up, and you, we'll talk about this hopefully in a, in a minute, the, at your rehabilitation facilities, you got these robots that yeah increase slightly. But but anyway, I've had issues where like just sitting down on a hard surface, I get like really bad pain. So I sit for decades. I've sat on cushions. Mm. Uh, but anyway, this is, this so I'm so I can't I can't exercise as much as I used to. To get back to the hypoxia, now you can buy or you don't need to buy anything, but you can go on Amazon or whatever and buy little cuffs to go, say, above your biceps muscle and kind of partially shut the blood supply off. And then, you know, if you do your resistance training, um, and this has actually been shown clinically, yes. you can kind of accentuate, you, you can build muscle with less um, actual, you know, exercise. Ex exercise. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So I, I that and is is that thought to be uh is, is the mechanism of that known? No, it's not known. So huh. maybe you can look at yeah. Let, well let, we, let, let's we, get to let let's move on to to um how you're gonna how you are you know translating some of this uh in 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 animal models and then kind of what you're envisioning for the clinic. One thing that we both worked on. And actually, we did some when I was in Kentucky in the late 90s. Is So we did a lot of work with caloric restriction, right? Yes. Re reducing calorie intake. So reducing carbs, reducing glucose intake, right? And maybe go into a ketogenic state. And so we wondered, and, and it turns out that we'd also worked on these stress proteins. There's heat shock proteins, but then there's another one in this, what you call ER endoplasmic reticulum, these compartments that seem to be foreign sensors of cellular stress. One of them, was, it was initially called BIP. Right. But now most people refer to it as GRP78, glucose-regulated protein 78. Yeah. And it was discovered by um, Amy, some, Amy something at UCLA. She's, a, I think, in the cancer field. But she discovered it because she exposed cultured cells to 2-deoxyglucose, and she found that expression of this gene encoding the GRP78, this important, it's called protein chaperone in the endoplasmic reticulum, it just shot up. Uh, and we've done some work on the GRP78, showing it was neuroprotective by manipulating it. I know, and I'm then, familiar with that. And, and then, you know, so then we started doing... We did some cell cultures with 2-deoxyglucose pretreating and protecting against glutamate or other insults. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we did some in vivo studies. And then you 
you've done some interesting work with 2DG. I, I think it's, this is something that could be used in the clinic and for our viewers and listeners. Um, so the 2-deoxyglucose, um, drug companies probably aren't interested in too much. Yes. Because, uh, I guess maybe if they had a use patent, I, maybe you have a patent. We we never we haven't we never actually filed a patent protection. Yeah, I think we um, we filed a provisional, but we never have we haven't followed it up yeah. because our commercialization committee said it's unlikely that it would have. Um, uh, you know, I I I did. There's another thing that another stress inducer besides so two deoxyglucose glucose kind of causes caloric restriction at the cellular level if you want to look at it kind of a superficial level right but there's this molecule called uh two four dnp two four dinitrophenol and huh. essentially it causes a lot of stress in the mitochondria huh. and you know we found it was neuroprotective and then there's this company called mitocon that they actually have somehow through philanthropy and stuff, then they've got some FDA approval. They're doing some clinical trials of this toxin, but at low concentrations, it, it's very safe. Well, I, I think it, I think as you know, we we actually found that at remarkably low concentrations in animals that 2DG has these uh, similar beneficial effects to what you had described um, although I, I, I think it, um, you know, I think it, it, as you've pointed out in the past, it's, it's clear that the metabolic switch that can happen to ketones may be important for a particular set of conditions. Um, there also may be challenges in the long-term use of something that creates ketones. Okay. Um, and, and I know, I just saw a recent paper that suggests that, Chronic ketogenic diet can actually induce senescence in cells, but um, and so chronic. We did, we did. Uh, I don't think we ever published it, but Don Ingram. I don't know if you ever met him, but he was kind of a senior person, but he ended up in my lab, and, and I we'd done some stuff with the two DG. He did a he supplemented the diet of rats with two DG, huh? And looked at lifespan, huh? So they were eating two DG every day, and it. It shortened lifespan, and it, they did the pathology, and there were some problems with the heart. So, I think you know, continuously taking this is not good, but maybe intermittently might be good. Well, I think one of the things we're exploring is, and I think this, it's kind of ironic. It just shows that there are really no new discoveries because, essentially, <laughs> what our focus is is that low doses of 2DG. In fact, you know, we're collaborating with a group at the University of Miami, uh, Ted Lampetus, and they're using 2DG for cancer. And the concentrations they have to use because cancer cells love glucose yeah. and um, the concentrations that they have to use in humans are estimated to be 60 fold higher than what we used Um in our uh, studies. And the idea is our hypothesis is, is that, as you know, glucose can go either into affecting, into generating ATP, or it goes into this process called N-link glycosylation, which is in the endoplasmic reticulum, which just makes proteins fold properly. Yeah. So if you inhibit the N-link glycosylation, the proteins don't fold but they fold in a way that is not lethal to them. They they unfold and then they activate this ER stress response that ultimately drives genes that are involved in plasticity. And I think I think this concept is very much aligned with something you've written about, and that is that it it makes total sense that there would be evolutionary pressure to drive genes involved in learning and memory when somebody was starving. Isn't that right? right. So uh, this provides essentially the detailed mechanism by which that occurs. Now, the question that we're trying to address now pharmacologically with Ted's help is uh, there are analogs of 2DG. So 
glucose is six is a six carbon sugar on the two carbon 2dg has no hydroxyl group what you can do is instead of sticking a hydroxyl group you can stick a fluoride so it's two it's f fluorodeoxyglucose and this is used i think people may be aware of it it's used commonly in pet scans to try to look for cancers uh, for inflammation um, and that's because the cancer cells and the inflammatory cells take up more glucose. And so you can actually see that on a yeah. PET scan. Um, but it also turns, so the fluorodeoxyglucose has, so that the hydrogen on that carbon can be either up or down. So if it's down, it's FDG, but if it's up, it's what's called fluorodeoxymanose, which so the, the the we we always when we think about sugars we think about uh, glucose but there are other sugars like mannose yeah, sure. that are critical for cell function including N-linked glycosylation and the the difference between glucose and mannose is the concentration of glucose is about five to six millimolar the concentration of mannose is about three hundred micromolar so the concentration of a drug that might inhibit mannose's yeah. effects are much lower than glucose. So what we're doing is we're using, we actually have a grant that's being reviewed right now where we're proposing that F, uh, 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 fluorodeoxymannose would only affect ER stress and not affect glycolysis. And our prediction is, is that that drug is going to be much more effective as an intermittent treatment, maybe a real mimic of intermittent fasting. And it's not going to have the toxicities that you're going to see with other drugs. So you can induce, induce the adaptive stress response without compromising energy metabolism. Exactly. That's exactly what we want to do. And I think that it's going to be a really, so we're, we're proposing to test all three compounds because maybe you want a little bit of both, but this is really a chemical strategy to be able to tell us, you know, uh, you know, at least in an Alzheimer's model, which one, which approach is better. And I think we have strong uh, predictions, but I think it kind of gets to what you're saying. It, it There may be lots of analogs of nutrients. I mean, N-acetylcysteine is an analog of nutrient. A nutrient. There are lots of, uh, you know, nicotinamide riboside. There are lots of analogs of nutrients that are ripe for potential interventions in humans. And I think one of the things that we have to figure out is, are the do these just become proof of concepts that because the because the definitive studies are supported by the government, or is there a way to commercialize these so that a company can actually make money off of them yeah. and then they can be distributed? But I think the third thing is their lack of expense potentially makes them deployable around the world, even in countries where uh, the cost of, um, you know, the, 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 the healthcare budgets are, are much lower. And I think that's we're really excited about this work. And it's, you know, I mean, we were, we essentially rediscovered what you already discovered. You already showed that 2DG upregulates uh, GRP78. GRP78 is one of the ER stress uh, proteins that's upregulated. So it's clear that we're, we were looking at the same ph phenomenon. And the fact that we all are getting robust effects in animals suggests really at how i think it also suggests at, at, at how reproducible and uh the response is and yeah. i think figuring out to, how to deploy it and what's the intermittency is key because um i i think uh i think uh intermittency of stress responses is essential and we can talk more about that when whenever yeah. you like so essentially what you just described, and you, you really didn't mention the, the models, but you had a paper in Neuron in last year yes, where you showed these low concentrations of 2-deoxyglucose protect the brain against experimental stroke, and then you used a complicated genetic uh, 
mouse model of Alzheimer's where the animals get amyloid pathology and they also get tangle pathology? No. No, no they, they, it's just, just a lot of mutations that increase the amyloid, I guess. That's right. Um, and a, a very, a lot of inflammation, a very aggressive Alzheimer's model. And cognitive impairment, which cognitive you know, impairment. And you, you showed that this 2-deoxyglucose um, not only protected the neurons when you look at the brain uh, at, or the amyloid, but also improved the functional outcome in motor function in the stroke model and learning and memory and the Alzheimer's. And, I, you know, I think this is really exciting. And it's unfortunate way that, as you kind of alluded to, the way the system's set up um, you know, big clinical trials are almost always uh, supported by drug company money. Yes. Right. And, you know, they aren't going to do clinical trials with something that they don't have a patent on or can't make money. But on the other hand, there are many things. I, when I was in Kentucky, we'd done some work. Again, this is another example of something inducing kind of mitochondrial stress response. There's a drug called diazoxide. Hmm. So it was actually used to treat hypertension a long time ago. It's very potent. It opens potassium channels and causes, uh, well, relaxation of the memory, you know, decreased excitability of the cell. Hmm. Um, but it, there's also these potassium channels in the mitochondrial membrane and it'll do we found that was very neuroprotective. And there was a, I don't know if you came across this neurologist, uh, Wes Ashford was yeah. at Kentucky. And he was clinician seeing Alzheimer's patients. And this is an off patent drug. It was FDA approved for hypertension. So he, without you know any protocol in place or anything, he prescribed it to some of his Alzheimer's patients, and this is anecdotal, but he claims it was having beneficial effects. We we went to the company that initially made the drug and got the patent for hypertension long, 40 years ago now, 50 years ago, whatever. It was one of the first drugs for hypertension, and they didn't have an interest in it, this kind of, so it, it may never, get tested yeah well i i i i think that's you know i think that the the government has set up a lot of systems to be able to potentially test drugs where i mean uh you know uh gary gibson here at, at for a long uh, time yeah yeah so gary has a 40 center 45 million dollar nih study using a drug called benfotamine which is also you know, not patentable, yeah. but um, I, the NIH uh, supported this effort. And I think if, you know, if benfotamine were to be beneficial, then pharma would show interest. Yeah. So I think that, I think, I think the, I think the NIH has done a great job of creating structures that allow us to take these okay, good. Uh, agents that are, off patent and potentially test them. And I think, you know, it, it really requires the energy and commitment though, of, you know, getting the IND going forward. You, you know, one thing that happened you know, when we were doing all this work on intermittent fasting and I was at NIH, and of course I know the administration there all the way up to the director. And so as the data started coming out and stuff, they finally got interested and then then finally, I think four years ago, they put out an RFA for clinical trials of intermittent fasting in humans. Mm -hmm. A lot of money for you know cancers, neurological disorders. And there's now, if you go on clinicaltrials.gov, there's over 200 trials of intermittent fasting. Um, so have they put out... So th there needs to be kind of some... There isn't really that kind of a stimulus, is there? Or is well, there? I, I, I think that um, uh, I, I think the I the things I would say that um, 
probably not that great a, stu- a stimulus, but there's an urgent need. There are infrastructures for actually doing trials. And yeah, I think what catalyzed the movement of Gary's uh, studies with benfotiamine forward is they did a 100 patient pilot trial here at Burke where the primary endpoint failed, but all the secondary endpoints were improving. Now, that's a very highly underpowered study. It's only was only 70 patients. But I think that kind of that kind of smoke in humans goes a long way, yeah. isn't that right? Yeah. And yeah. so to the extent that the um the institutes support these pilot trials that give confidence about safety yeah. and uh, some evidence of efficacy, then I think y- you they can grow into larger phase two and phase three studies. And I would say, you know, we have, I mean, we probably have uh, five examples now in the lab of drugs that target these stress sensors and how they can be potentially beneficial. And, um, and so I think, you know, I, uh, and we didn't, in, in very, like with 2DG, we never started out thinking we would end up with an adaptive stress response, but we, that's where we ended up. And so it is, it's, and I think that's where I, I find a lot of resonance with your work. It, it, it is, it makes a lot of sense that um, you want drugs that are going to drive a homeostatic response, that the goal is to restore homeostasis and the body knows how to how to balance all these different priorities. Isn't that right? It's yeah. sort of figured that out over millions of years of evolution. And now we have just a, in, an army of small molecules that potentially can affect these responses. I think the keys, though, are, as you point out, that they have to be given intermittently. And how the question is how intermittently? Yeah. Is it once a week enough? Is twice a week enough? And and maybe more of the studies need to be focused on figuring that out. Yeah. I and um and I think that uh the persistence, if they're persistent, so we often look for these responses in autopsy brains, isn't that right? And or we look for evidence of and and the persistence of these responses is a bad sign because if you have persistence of these stress responses, this the yeah. cell says, I'm not, I'm not compensating. And we have to have time to recover. <laughs> yes, you need a recovery phase. And, and so I, I really think that, that, um, you know, there is a logic that's coming together. Yeah. It just has to be that we have to try to codify it. Isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. For, to really augment treatment. Do you want to talk a little bit uh, be do you still have a few more minutes? Yeah, you? I do. I okay. Do. So there's two other uh, areas you've worked on um, with regards to translating, you know, basic work to the clinic. One has to do with, um, so we're talking about stress response of this antiviral stress response. Talk about what the heck's I got to do with protecting neurons. <laughs> Good question. So, um, do you want the long or the short version? <laughs> well, this, you know, this is an area I'm. Go ahead. This. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I'll tell you, we the way we got interested in this is that, um, and it, and and it really dovetails with work other people have done is that. When I was still at Harvard, we did a screen. We we were very interested in, in FDA approved drugs that would activate hypoxic adaptation. Mm-hmm. So we stably expressed a HIF reporter in a hippocampal neuroblast and we screened drugs to find which one could drive the luciferase reporter, which you just, it's just the luciferase from Firefly. So you measure light. Mm-hmm. And I had a visiting scientist from Taiwan and uh, a neurologist, and I said, this will be a good project for you. And what he found is that the number one hit 
in that um, drug screen was a drug called Tilarone. And Tilarone turns out to be the first antiviral immunomodulatory drug. It was developed in 1960. And um, and we I had uh, we showed that if you if you treat with Tilarone twelve hours before inducing an ischemic stroke, you reduce the stroke size by ninety percent. And initially we thought, oh well, this is working through the HIF pathway. But I had uh, uh, another visiting scientist come to the lab, and I said, it doesn't look like it's activating HIF. Um, maybe you should check out whether it's activating the antiviral interferon response. So it was initially used to treat the flu and it it lost FDA approval because it had some side effects. And, um, and lo and behold, that drug was massively inducing interferon genes in the brain. And, uh, and uh, uh, there have been two observations by other scientists that really catalyze this. Mary Stenzel Poor in Oregon was she was an immunologist, and she took hypoxic preconditioning. She took LPS, which is uh, a a part of what makes bacteria um, bad for you, and she took um, and she took what's called poly DIDC, which is kind of an RNA mimic. And when she used all of these agents, they could precondition the brain against stroke. And the commonality of all of these three agents was 13 interferon genes. And they were many of the same genes that we found upregulated by Tilleron. Now, when we, when we were looking around to find out what Tilleron actually does, we found that it, its action is, is that it inserts itself into DNA. And in 2013, mm -hmm. a guy named James Chen who was working at UT Southwestern discovered this uh, sensor for, so DNA is in our nucleus and it's in our mitochondria. It's not supposed to be in our cytoplasm, right. but if it's in the cytoplasm, that is a danger signal that yeah. says, maybe I'm, I'm infected by a virus or maybe my mitochondria and my, or my nucleus are damaged. And what happens is the double-stranded DNA, if it's greater than 45 base pairs, it binds to a protein called C-gas. And C-gas generates uh, a, a second messenger, and it's a dinucleotide second messenger called cyclic GAMP. And then that activates a series of downstream proteins, I won't go through all of them, that ultimately turn on all the interferon genes. And so we initially thought, oh, well, maybe Tellerone's just stabilizing DNA and activating C gas. That turned out not to be the case. But in doing those experiments, we were led to the fact that there are now um, small molecule activators of the downstream target of, uh, of uh, cyclic GAMP. It's called STING, stimulator of interferon genes. And there are small are drugs that activate this pathway. And if you give these drugs to an animal 12 hours before stroke, it completely, uh, th there's practically no stroke. And if you do it in an animal that doesn't have sting, it's not protective. So now we feel like we've mapped the pathway. Yeah that uh and this stress response and it it there is an exciting paper by tony whiskere you know he's done a lot of the yeah. parabiosis experiments he showed that gancyclovir which is thought to be a antiviral drug mm -hmm. it actually can act as a sting agonist huh. so there may be drugs that we can actually move into humans very quickly that can activate this pathway that and you might say, well, why would the interferon response be so protective against stroke? Well, if you think about it, if the brain, if any cell in our body thinks it's inf infected, the, the interferons are there to essentially shut down macromolecular synthesis. It turns off, um, it turns off translation so that the virus can't replicate and essentially shuts down metabolism. 
So the ATP demand goes way down and the ATP, so it balances the ATP supply with the demand. Now I will tell you what's really exciting is that there's a flip side to this response, which you're probably aware of, uh, Mark, and that is a beautiful paper published in Nature about a year ago by Andrea Blosser, which showed that in aged mice, if you start at 20 months, maybe the equivalent of what would be 65 for us, okay? And you give a sting antagonist to the time the animal is 26 months, you completely block the degeneration in the hippocampus and the, and the, the uh, memory decline that happens with aging. And, um, and, and so it appears that this response, as we age, for reasons that are still obscure, in the paper, they, they speculate that during aging, your mitochondria become leaky and the DNA starts getting released into the cytoplasm that then activates sea gas, uh, which activates cyclic GMP sting and then upregulates all these interferon genes that then downregulate memory. And what we, we have a paper that we're putting together that suggests that this, uh, so they hypothesize that it takes six months and you need hippocampal degeneration. What we can show is that a single dose of sting uh, agonist is sufficient to reduce LTP, long-term potentiation, a form of synaptic plasticity in the brain and reduce learning and memory. So you don't, and this may be why, you know how the morning after you have a cold, why when you, you have so much trouble getting your head off the pillow and you feel this kind of brain fog, we think That's it's because of this stress sensing pathway. But the, and, and so blocking it before stroke is, is a good thing. What we're finding is, is that it, if it's persistent, it may contribute to cognitive aging. And also it may be activated after stroke to limit stroke recovery. And has someone been looking at this in relation to long COVID? Yeah, so uh, there, the, the data is, uh, people have been looking at it um, and I don't, but I don't think that, uh, and the data would be maybe consistent with it. Um, although there are other uh, models. I think the problem is, is that, you have to be able to assess what's going on with the sea gas sting pathway in a in a living human, and I think that's where you know PET ligands hopefully can be developed that actually allow one to be able to uh, yeah. look at this pathway. Yeah. But but it turns out that there are FDA approved drugs. So one of the hypotheses is that um, you know sea gas and sting get activated in a cell type in the brain called microglia, they release these chemokines, CCL3, CCL4, and CCL5, and they bind to a receptor called CCR5. And that turns out to be the HIV receptor. Hmm. And there's a drug for that, that bo box that called Maraviroff. And Alcino Silva at UCLA and Tom Carmichael there have um, used Maraviroff in animal models with great success. Uh, we have, um, you know, following on their work and Marabra could be used in humans immediately. So I think a, a careful trial of Marabra in long COVID would be important. I, I My concern is, is I think long COVID is probably many things. Yeah. Like if you have pulmonary dysfunction, maybe there's some hypoxia. If you have cardiac dysfunction, maybe there's some hypoperfusion. If you have, um, so if you're depressed, um, you know, for other reasons, then I think that can contribute. So I think I, I did a, a, po a, a, a podcast on this. I'll be happy to send it to you where um, I tried to create an algorithm for the evaluation somebody might go through to ultimately uh uh, for it, ferret out what might be the culprits in causing their brain fog. Yeah. And one one more example. So you had a paper in Cell in 2019 uh, with showing that selenium 
uh, can right. be very neuroprotective. Can you talk about, so we talked a lot about iron paraptosis. So this has an interesting thing from an evolutionary perspective because yeah. it's thought that the first life uh, was in these deep ocean vents, volcanic vents. Yes. They had very, very high concentrations of iron, uh, hydrogen sulfide gas, um, and, and metals in general, I think. And so yeah. iron, selenium, arsenic, people have heard, know it's toxic. But iron and selenium are very interesting because they we they they can be very toxic, but we've evolved so many interesting ways not only to protect cells uh, against the toxicity, but to actually use those metals to their advantage. Yes, right. Yeah, so I think I think you're right. I mean, as uh, you know, maybe the metals were there before oxygen started to evolve. So as oxygen was utilized, there had to be mechanisms that were developed that counteracted yes. the toxicity that leveraged the high reactivity of oxygen with metals in the form of ATP and mitochondria, but also that evolved antioxidant enzymes that could withstand the stress that was imposed simply by using oxygen for energy. Isn't that right? So as you probably know, these selenium, when it's incorporated, sorry about this, uh, in the, from the hospital the the when selenium is incorporated as selenocysteine it has a lot of advantages over cysteine in that it it's uh its properties are such that it can be oxidized that is it can uh, uh lose an electron and it can gain an electron back very rapidly whereas with cysteine it can be modified irreversibly by oxidants. So our bodies have evolved selenoproteins that resist this oxidative damage. And there are 25 selenoproteins. And but the but the the redox activity of selenium also potentially gives it a very narrow therapeutic range. Now, what's fascinating about ferroptosis is its most essential antidote is an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase 4, which is a selenoprotein, okay? And um, so in order to, and, uh, and, and so, and, and the thought is that, um, uh, so the simple idea was that when you add selenium to cells, um, that you would, optimize glutathione peroxidase 4 activity and protect against ferroptosis. And that's what we found. What surprised us and what was unusual, and again, it kind of gets back to the fact that we, you know, we keep being dragged back to the nucleus, is that we found that if you, if you give selenium to a neuron, um, it upregulates GPX4, but it does it requires new transcription. And it suggested to us that, and what we found was that not only was selenium, and this was pharmacological levels of selenium. So the neurons have totally normal nutritional levels of selenium. If you add supra nutritional levels, you actually drive the expression of all the selenoproteins. And it kind of makes sense because here you have a metal that's kind of toxic. Yeah. The cell is is saying, I've got too much. What am I going to do? I'm going to upregulate all those proteins that would incorporate that selenium and use it. Yeah. Know, right. Yeah. So so we did an experiment where we injected selenium directly into the ventricle, one dose, and we induced a brain hemorrhage and it protected. But what we found is that there's a parabolic dose response. And I think this is something you highlighted that. It, even though there's a protective concentration, you reach a peak and yeah. then it starts to become toxic. And this is a real problem therapeutically because you never know. So we had this idea that the, the chaperone protein around the body is a protein called selenoprotein P. 
And it's a unique protein in that it's C-terminal end. When there's an N-terminal and a C-terminal end of the protein, the C-terminal end of the protein has lots of selenocysteines. And so the simple idea was to take those amino acids, six amino acids from the C-terminal end with two selenocysteines and link it to a TAT protein, which it has, is a is a, a part of the HIV TAP protein that when it's 11 amino acids that when you link it to this peptide, it now can get into the brain on its own. And so we did that and we, we first did it in vitro and lo and behold, what we found was that the parabolic dose response disappeared. It became sigmoidal. If you incorporate selenium into selenocysteine, you now have this amazing dose response. And the advantage of just taking selenocysteine is now you can imagine using a targeting peptide to target it at wherever you want in the brain. Isn't that right? And uh, and so I uh, we were able to show that um, it not only blocked ferroptosis in vitro, but it blocked hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. And you know, again, I think um, you know I'm I'm very excited to kind of uh, take peptides like. TAT NR2BC that Mike Timiansky developed for stroke or other peptides that have already been shown to have some effect and simply stick the six amino acids on the, the end. Yeah. Because now you get this amazing upregulation of 384 genes we call the selenome that block baroptosis, ER stress-induced apoptosis, excitotoxicity, and I think it is, again, another just beautiful example of how these sort of endogenous programs are ripe for treatment in yeah. humans. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, uh, we don't understand what the sensor is there. I'm very interested in trying to figure that out. But I think it 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 is an exciting uh, line of investigation, which kind of fits um, well with the theme that's been running through our research throughout my career. Yeah, yeah, so this idea of, you know, challenge or stress recovery cycles, I, I'm using the word challenge a lot any more than stress because stress sometimes yeah. has a bad connotation. Right. But, um, you know, exercise is a challenge, fasting is a challenge. Yeah, at, I, at the cellular level, the, the cells do perceive it as a, a stressful, you know, pot potentially dangerous situation if it continues for too long. Yes, uh, and I, I like yeah, the so tra for translation. There's this, you know, this is kind of a new idea. Yes. Uh, if you look at the big picture, and that idea of intermittent dosing is very foreign to drug companies and so on. In fact. Usually they develop a drug so that they want it to kind of get steady, called steady state levels. But and those those drugs are almost always blocking some, like blocking one particular pathway or has you know one particular target. But in this case, the idea is to activate a, sequ a sequence of gene expression that's evolutionarily conserved to deal with stress. Yes. And, and then you're, in theory, protecting the cell in, in, in multiple ways against many different kinds of Absolutely. I, I think that's it. And I like the word challenge because I think that it, um, you know, sometimes I think people don't realize that if you go and you exercise, but you don't, it may be better to do short periods of exercise where you really push yourself. Isn't that right? than it is to yeah. kind of yeah you know but yeah. but i but i think the 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 issue is is that uh maybe uh challenging the boundaries of homeostasis is a way of bringing the system back into to um into a homeostatic and if you don't if you don't challenge the system it becomes complacent that's right and and, and not able to respond adaptively so and 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 i think that would be the downside of taking antioxidants continuously isn't that right right and there's been i mean they trials failed um yes. and 
the guy Ristow, right? You know, he's worked in, I think he's yes. in Germany, showed with with exercise, if you load up people with vitamin E and have them exercise, they actually, their performance goes down. Ah, huh. interesting. Yeah, and, and so these, these free radicals have important signaling functions, right? And Absolutely. if you stop them all up, it's not good either. Uh, I, I, you know, it, it, it's so ironic because, um, you know, there's this practice, uh, which a lot of people are skeptical about called homeopathy, where you take small amounts of substances well, yeah. to, uh, yeah. but I think what we're talking about is kind of a molecular form of that. Isn't that right? Where you're really trying to. Well, we're of... talking, there's another word that it, maybe some people get confused, hormesis. Or me, and this is yeah. just the idea of a biphasic dose response, you know, right? That uh, low to moderate doses of something can do a good thing, but if you get too much, I mean, this is all wisdom, everything in moderation, right? It, it, it it's uh, it is uh, it, it is the the empiric distillate of many, many years of experience, isn't that right? And w all we're doing is kind of putting. A molecular face behind it yeah now. and that's where i think uh I, I think it's a very optimistic view because um it really suggests that people can be doing things in their daily lives that's right to challenge themselves yeah. and that is, as long as they're giving themselves enough time to rest right. in between that so, that so really focus on so listeners and viewers, focus on what Raj and I are talking about. That's a challenge to your neurons. Right. And then get a good night's sleep. That's right. That's well, the well, you know, and 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 interestingly, I mean, I, I think one of the things we speculate on in the neuron paper is the idea that, you know, if you stop eating at six o'clock, if you don't eat after six o'clock, by the time you sleep, you may reach a level of uh, fasting to actually activate the ER stress response. Isn't that right? Where you're going to decrease your end mm -hmm. length oscillation. So maybe by, sleeping, by morning anyway. Yeah, by morning. So so maybe sleep, actually, some of its benefits involve the fact that you can actually activate these. Who, who's the up at, up at University of Pennsylvania, the sleep group up there, there's a a woman and an older guy who they've looked at ER stress response and sleep or something. I think it we we uh, found some papers where people have shown ER stress goes up. Yeah, goes yeah. Up. And um, and it is interesting that um, you know people talk about the fact that it's uh, you know continuous sleep rather than fragmented sleep, and maybe there's something about the fragmentation that actually disrupts. Yeah. these uh, uh, stress responses. So it may be that you you can get, um, and, but, but again, I, I would say that one of the things we're hoping to do is if we can start to get some blood biomarkers mm. of what's a therapy, when is BDNF actually increased in the brain, yeah. then I think each of us can figure out what's our right dose. Isn't that right? Of how long do you are you Are you started or getting interested in or collaborating with someone on extracellular vesicles and we we uh i i i haven't but i would uh i would love to do that i think what we're planning to do is to initially the idea is to simply do single uh nuclear rna sequencing on cells of the blood in animals and oh, okay. correlate that with what's going on in the brain if yeah. If ER stress is occurring in the blood at the same time it's occurring in the brain, then that becomes. A... You know, there's a, a neurologist who was under me when I was NIA, uh, Dimitros Kapagianis, and he's he developed this method where he uses an antibody against the neuronal protein, membrane protein, and he isolates these extracellular vesicles from blood. And then uses the antibody to pull down the vesicles that are probably coming from neurons. Ah, that would and, be fantastic. And he's even shown that, like with all mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, so these vesicles, they have tau, the microtubule-associated protein, and it's 
hyperphosphorylated. So he's kind of using this as biomarkers for what's going on in the brain. He even showed that in people with um, AD and diabetes, that these vesicles have the insulin receptor substrate, protein mm -hmm. one. It's a anyway. He he can get indication of the relative insulin sensitivity of the brain of the brain by probing so these. Where is he? I'd love. He's to... at NIA. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll get in touch with him. I, I, I was I was I, his, I was his boss. Huh. Interesting. Well, the other thing I think that we haven't uh, talked about, but I'm I'm curious about is to what extent does 2DG interface with glucose sensing neurons that maybe are responsive to like GLP-1 agonists and things like that? I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So th it seems like there's a, you know, a, a vast array of things that we could explore, which we probably won't do ourselves, but we'd love to do collaboratively. Okay, Raj, I, I appreciate you taking uh, uh, this is terrific. time, and it's, it's good to see you again. You're looking great, and thank you. Things are That's going great. well up there. And say say hi to Gary, and I will do yeah. that. It was great to talk to you. Thanks, Mark. Be well. You too. Bye.